seated thank you as I was singing that I kept looking at my grandson who's here whose name is Jacob but it's not his ladder we're climbing though but uh, I, I love this young man and uh, he was given that name for that reason because Jacob plays an amazing role in the life of the Bible who would later be known as Israel and so uh, Amen. Barbara's going to read now from Romans 8. So if you could pay your attention to that scripture. Thank you. Romans 8, 18 through 27. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Sinner, do you love my Jesus? Sinner, do you love my Jesus? Sinner, do you love my Jesus? Soldiers of the cross, well... For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own. Okay, I think we're need to go ahead. All right. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You know, Barbara, I know I'm a little slow, but as I was reading along with you, sinner, do you know my Jesus? And I'm saying, it's not in my Bible. <laughs> I, I, I have to check this... Uh, translation but you know it worked well it, it flowed very nicely no problem one thing I love about this church is that we could roll with the punches and uh, it's okay it's okay that's what I keep telling myself in life it's a, it's gonna be okay it's gonna be all right so I want to ask you a question this morning church have you ever noticed that sometimes life could hand us unexpected situations? Has that ever happened to you? Not today. Not, not today. But something pops up that you didn't expect, that you were not prepared to deal with, and it, it hit you broadside uh, and, and stunned you, actually. And I think all of us could say we've had that happen. Things turned out not the way we thought they would. You know, I was reading an excerpt from the former President Ronald Reagan's speech 
where he told this story uh, that he claimed to be true. And I'll have to take his word on it. When he was the governor of California, he was told about a newspaper photographer working in the area of Los Angeles who was called by the editor to cover a raging fire that was happening in one of the valleys there. You know, there's lots of fires around Los Angeles. His assignment was to rush to this small airport, board a waiting plane, get some photos of the fire, and get back to the newspaper as soon as possible for the afternoon edition. Now, breathlessly, this photographer raced to the airport. He drove his car to the runway, and sure enough, there was a plane waiting with its engines revving. He got on board, and at about 500 feet, he began taking his camera equipment out of his bag, and he told the pi pilot to get him over the fire so he could take photos and get back to his office. From the other side of the cockpit, there was a deafening silence. Then he heard these unsettling words. Aren't you the instructor? <laughs> he got on the wrong plane. He didn't expect that to happen, did he? And sometimes we experience things like that. The very last thing we expect happens. Our lives are going smoothly. You know, the waves are gentle, seas are calm. We thought we were under control. And then, oops, a little voice whispers in your ear, aren't you the instructor? These things happen. And we realize that we're in trouble and things are just not going according to, to the way we thought they would, according to the plan. And so this text that was read by Barbara, it recognizes that life does not always operate according to our plan. It doesn't work that way. Paul writes, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later on. And so yes, we have moments in our lives where we suffer and we're going through hard times. But to be alive, to be a living creature on this earth is to have problems. Some problems are big and some problems are small. Some struggle with health problems. I remember, and uh, Martha, I'm going to need your help on this to see if my information is correct. Handel's Messiah, a masterpiece. And it's endured generations for over 250 years. Handel's Messiah. We sing it around Christmas time. I love it. Well, the next time you hear Handel's Messiah, try to remember that five years before his composing this masterpiece at the age of 52, Handel suffered a terrible stroke. In spite of his stroke, he was able to compose this beautiful piece of music. And if I might digress for a moment, a personal experience, when I was attending Drew University's theological school, pursuing my MDiv degree, I had a theological professor by the name of Dr. Thomas Long. Now, that may not be a household name to you, but he had a tremendous impact on my life. If you Google his name, he's a prominent, or was a, he's gone home to be with the Lord, he was a prominent theological ethics scholar whose name was known throughout the theological environment across the world. He's written, or he had written, over 40 books at the time I was a student there at Drew, and yet he suffered a stroke that crippled him on one side. To our amazement, he made it back to the classroom in a rather speedy way. And even though he walked with a limp, and he had slurred speech, and he had a drooping side to his face, he resumed teaching. And he wrote other books following that stroke. 
and I was privileged to be a student under his teaching. He never gave up. He was hit with an unforeseen incident in his life, and yet he managed to hold on to faith and continue to truck on. You know, it's comforting to know that people can often come back after a stroke or cancer or even a heart attack or how many of our military personnel are coming back home with lost limbs and yet they truck on and they refuse to give up and they live a noble and productive life. I've heard people tell me, you know what, I've got money problems, I've got financial problems even though the poorest person in America is richer than most people around the world. Did you know that? And I've said this before, you know, you're sleeping in a house, you got a roof over your head, fresh running water, a toilet. Just think about if you didn't have a toilet. Now, I know you're all too young to remember outhouses. That must have been a real enjoyable trip in the middle of the night. And so we're blessed. We may think we have financial problems, but according to the rest of the world, we don't. You know, when Pablo Picasso was a young, impoverished artist, do you know he had to burn his own paintings to keep warm? I wish I could have stopped him. Just give me one. Give me one Picasso. Later on, his work would be worth millions of dollars. But he never gave up as a young artist. And he continued to push, knowing that God had given him the talent that he had, and this was just the beginning. You know, another master musician by the name of Mozart, and I know you are aware of that, he was so poor that he was unable to buy wood to heat his little room that he lived in. He sat with his hands wrapped in woolen socks in order to play the piano, and composed music. He died of tuberculosis. Listen to this, at the age of 35. I never knew that. His vitality and his stamina lowered by constant hunger and cold and the lack of proper nourishment. Just six people followed his cheap coffin when he died. And even they turned back after it started to rain. The total cost of his funeral, $3.10. Mozart, just think about that. We may have money problems, and I'm sure some of you might be struggling financially. We might have health problems. We might have family relationship problems. You know, somebody said you could pick your friends, but you can't choose your family. <laughs> There's some truth to that. You know, we might find ourselves alone and lonely thinking that nobody cares, nobody knows what I'm going through. We may be unhappy with our appearance. My wife's always making fun about my nose. She says it's a big Italian nose. And I always say, you have a little cute button nose. Some people aren't happy about their height. They feel they're too tall or they're too short or too thin or too heavy. And they, they look in the mirror, and I remember one comedian says, this woman was looking in the mirror, and she says, oh, I'm too fat. There must be something wrong with this mirror. <laughs> and we struggle. We may be hurting because of a broken relationship, division in a family. We may be grieving over a loved one that's no longer with us, and it's painful. There is nobody here this morning, friends, who does not have a problem. We may not share it, but I truly believe that if you, and I don't want you to look to your left and right and behind you in front of you, but every single one of us seated here this morning could think of something that we're working through. That life is not this magical uh, tiptoe through the tulips life. Life is real. 
And I want to tell you, if you don't have a problem this morning, don't worry, you will. You will. And so our text, however, doesn't talk about problems, even though it mentions suffering. It talks more about hope. Hope. And I don't want to just remind you of your problems and have you leave here all discouraged and saying, boy, he really brought me down this morning. That's not my job as a pastor. My job as a shepherd is to lift you up so that you can go back out into the world and make a difference with kindness. This message this morning is all about positive expectations. It's about a creator God who works to bring order out of chaos and joy out of our pain and character out of our conflict and clarity out of our confusion and doubt. Because sometimes we're very confused about what's going on in our lives. And the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. So if we feel confused and we feel as if we're doubting and we really don't know what's going on, a good place to go to is God. Now Paul paints a magnificent picture of a world in which hope is triumphant. Hope is triumphant. The good news is we can live in the light of that hope today right now. In other words, don't shut the door prematurely on the possibility of a favorable outcome. Now all of you know that I'm a Yankees fan. And uh, I know we got some folks from Massachusetts, so I apologize. <laughs> but I've seen people when I was at the stadium leave before the game even ends. And all you hear them saying, oh, these bums. That's what they say, these bums. And in their car, driving home, they got their game on the radio, and the Yankees score 10 runs in the ninth and come from behind and win. And they say, oh, we should have never left. <laughs> they gave up too quick. The doctor tells us that only one in 10 comes back from this certain kind of surgery that we have to have. And we assume that we're one of the nine. Why not assume that you're that tenth person? Have that positive outlook, that positive expectation. I'm the one that's going to make it through. Somebody's got to. Why not me? Why not you? Why not assume the best instead of always assuming the worst? We know we can worry ourselves sick, that's for sure. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But why not believe that it's possible to believe ourselves well instead of sick? We should never give up, church. We should never give in to our circumstances. You know, a father and son were standing in a sanctuary just like this. And the father looked up at a stained glass window. A we have beautiful windows in this sanctuary. And it was a depiction of Jesus knocking on the door. There Jesus stood motionless before a closed door with his raised hand signifying that he was rapping on that door repeatedly. The father said to the son, I wonder why they don't let him in. After a moment's thought, the child thought, and he says, I think I know why, Daddy. I bet they're all in the basement and they can't hear them. Some of us need to get our thoughts and our spirit out of the basement to hear that knocking on the door by Jesus. We need to come out of that, that lull that we're in. That, uh, the, there was a term given years ago, the funk. The first time I heard it, I said, what the, is that a prof profane word? But some of us are in a funk, and we can't hear Jesus knocking on the door. I once sat in a park eating a soft pretzel. How many like soft pretzels? Aren't they good? Man, they're so good. And I apparently had dropped a piece of my pretzel on the ground, and I saw this small ant dra dragging this huge piece of pretzel. 
that piece of pretzel had to be 25 times its weight. And it was pulling on that piece of pretzel for 15 minutes with tremendous perseverance. I watched this ant struggle with this valued possession that he wanted to bring back to his buddies. Over and over again, he tried to pass over twigs and pebbles and other small debris that got in its way. To me, the debris was tiny. To that ant, it must have looked like huge concrete boulders that were blocking it from moving forward. Often it lost its grip. I noticed it would pull and then it would lose its grip on the pretzel, this magnificent prize. And finally, I grabbed the twig. I said, I got to help this little guy. And I started moving stuff out of the way. I, I made a highway for this ant. I, your pastor's not normal. I'm just going to tell you that. This little guy never lost its spirit. And it reminded me that although we may not be able to control our circumstances, we can control the effect that it has on us spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically. And how do we do that? Well, just as my hand reached down and helped this little ant, it, it, to that ant it must have seemed like a hand came out of heaven with a big log, which was a twig, and cleared the way for it to get through to its nest. So too we must entrust our circumstances, friends. We must entrust our barriers that are in our lives to the one who loves us enough to help move those obstacles out of our way and to get us through our predicament. Only then do we find the resources to get us through difficult times, those unexpected moments that pop up in our lives. I don't know of a better way to cope with life's problems, frankly, personally I'm talking about, how important it is that we not close the door too soon and call our situation hopeless. For with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. All things are possible with him. So regardless of our circumstances, we can carry on, friends, with his help. I want to let you know a little secret. Others have done it, and so can we. Do you believe it? Amen. So do I. Amen. All right, friends, let's respond by singing a wonderful hymn, Shout to the Lord. And I know Bobby's going to want to hear you shout. So if you're able to stand, please do so.
job. Thank you, church. You may be seated if you can. Shout for joy. Amen. Well, I have some prayer requests this week, and uh, I'd like to bring them to your attention for prayer. I always say this, but I'll repeat it again in case you don't know, that when I'm done praying, then I'm going to have a moment of silence for you to quietly bring your concerns to the Lord, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. I received a prayer request uh, uh, that Tom Griffin, he's gravely ill and he's going into hospice care. And this is uh, Eddie Blum's uh, brother-in-law down in Florida. And then there's a prayer request for Bob Arnst, who's being treated for cancer. And so we have two individuals that are struggling with cancer. And I do hope that you've been praying for these families down in Florida and the victims of that collapsed condominium uh, in Seaside, Florida. You know, when I saw the video of those buildings coming down, all I could think of was the World Trade Center, the way it pancaked down the way the construction of the building was very similar to the World Trade Center. They just, one floor collapsed on the other. And I was thinking at one o'clock in the morning, those poor souls who were in bed sleeping and the families, it reminded me again of Ground Zero where I saw families waiting to receive word if their loved one was found and recovered or rescued, a rescue mission. It's not a recovery mission yet. It's a rescue mission. And I, I know your heart, my heart breaks for these families. And the thought that there might be people still alive in that debris, wondering if anybody's gonna come and rescue them. So remember that so many families are struggling down there in Florida right now. And so if you could join me in a word of prayer, Lord, I just wanna lift up Tom and Bob to you. They too have families that are watching their loved ones struggle with disease. And sometimes the caregiver, Lord, the one who watches, suffers greatly too because many times we wish we could give an eye or a lung or give something to our loved one to save them from their disease, their illness. And at times we feel helpless, just sitting and watching. But Lord, we pray, we still pray. We still pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray with hope for all people who struggle with illness and disease. But especially this morning, we lift up Tom and Bob before you and their families. And Lord God, we lift up this situation down in Florida. We pray from the bottom of our heart that there are still people alive who will be rescued from that horrible mound of debris that once made up a condominium building. We pray for the families, Lord God. We've heard family members speaking on news, uh, a daughter talking about a mom, her best friend, the pain of waiting and hoping. And so, Lord God, we lift up all those families who are in standby mode and how uneasy and how painful that must be to be in such a state where they don't even know the condition or the situation of their loved ones. And so, Lord God, we pray for those people down there in Florida, and we thank you for the rescue workers, the emergency service responders who are committing themselves 24 hours a day to search and look for life. Be with them, Lord God, strengthen them, and guide them in their efforts. And so now, Lord, we take a moment of silence for members of our congregation, both here and who are watching from home, 
to lift up their prayers and join ours together. There's power in numbers. And so, Lord, we, may, we take this moment of silence. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this Amen, church. Let's stand now. We're going to sing our closing hymn, Lord Be Glorified, 2150. see the church. My benediction is very simple but profound. Not because I'm saying it, but because it's backed up in scripture. You're not alone. God knows what you're going through. Never give up on God because God will never give up on you. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, church. Enjoy this day.